wanted to provide a little uh, perspective. And I know every DOT, I think, is a little different. But here in Minnesota, um, we have jurisdiction over our interstates, our US highways, and state highways. But as you can see in this graph, that that's actually a relatively small percentage of the overall center line miles of roads. It's about 11 to 12%. Uh, next slide. And this is the map on the right here is kind of what that looks like. So that's the MnDOT system. And so despite only having 11 or 12%, you can see we have pretty good coverage across the state. Um, and uh, what I've done is worked with our Office of Land Management and then done some of my own kind of calculations to validate some of their numbers or at least from a curiosity standpoint, uh, per functional class. So again, per those three different types of roadways that we have jurisdiction over. And collectively, we refer to those three as our trunk highway system. So you might hear me say that. Uh, next slide. And so um, kind of from a starting point, I look to our what's referred to as the GASB 34 report. And I'm interested to know um, at the end here if other DOTs are familiar with this report. Um, I had not been until fairly recently. This is the Government Account Accounting Standards Board report. Um, it essentially is tracking all of our capital assets and that is used by the state for borrowing purposes and things of that nature. And back in the early 2000s, they um, use some assumed widths for certain types of roads based on design standards and things to uh, develop some baseline data. But since the early 2000s, they've actually been tracking the amount of acres that we have in a spreadsheet form, so not in a GIS form, in the spreadsheet form exactly. And so um, they, this is our official numbers, and they prefer that we use these numbers for the CCAA purpose. And it's likely the most accurate, um, but as you'll see on the, the bottom half of the slide here, I, out of curiosity, randomly selected 150 points in GIS across those three types of roadways and, and took my own measurements to see how they compared. Um, the numbers in the red are reverse calculations based on the right away acre numbers they gave me. And you can see that they don't quite line up. Um, but again, their numbers um, for the last 17 ish years are ac actual acres, um, both acquired and, and turned, turned over or sold. And so if we use that the GASB 34 report information, you can see we have about 256,000 acres, and this includes our miscellaneous acres like rest areas and then just random parcels that we have for a variety of reasons. Um, if we use my randomly selected uh, point data, you can see it's a little bit higher number, and that doesn't include our miscellaneous acreage, um, but likely that's an overestimate. And um, it, it took quite a while to go through 150 random points, and I'm um, Perhaps if I increase my sample size, the numbers would change, but I don't at this point plan on doing that unless I hear concerns or feedback from, from the group that you know they don't want us to use that, that GASB number. Next slide. And you know, for the the numbers I calculated, you know, this is just the formula. It's pretty straightforward math. Um, again kind of shows those calculations and the amount of acreage per uh, roadway type. So again, interstates, US highways, and Minnesota highways. Um, and those numbers there are the, um, my estimated numbers, those are not the GASB numbers. Next slide. And so, you know, what we've been thinking about here in Minnesota, and I know that milkweed and monarchs are different across the country, especially in the West. Um, but we're thinking that we're likely uh, at least eventually enroll everything including our paved surfaces this is going to significantly reduce the accounting and tracking that has to go into things um, here milkweed literally grows everywhere so you can see the center photo that's a common milkweed growing out of the base of a bridge abutment uh, in between a, a little rubber gasket they use to help keep moisture out of the concrete to 
uh, avoid freeze thaw issues in our cold climate. On the upper right there, you see that's common milkweed coming up uh, from a recently graded dirt road. Uh, and then on the lower right there, you see that's a common milkweed, again, growing out of a, a piece of old driftwood on Lake Superior in northern Minnesota. And so it really grows everywhere. We do have species that are adapted to the aquatic environment. And so uh, we have wetland species and, and music species and upland dry species and forested species. And um, we've seen it growing and I don't have good photos all this, this year is my goal. I've seen it growing out of soil stockpiles on active construction sites, um, out of cracks in the sidewalks. Um, so it really can grow anywhere here. So that's kind of our, our reason for that line of thinking. Uh, next slide. Sorry, my presentation is kind of big because I had a lot of photos in it, but so it might not. And so again, if we were to um, you know, enroll our full system, depending on which set of numbers, which at this point we're thinking would use the GASB numbers, which is that 256,000 acre number. Uh, and we have to meet that 8% uh, uh, conservation measure acreage threshold. We're looking at about 20 some thousand acres. Um, I won't have you do it, but if you were to go back a couple slides on our interstate system, we have about 40,000 acres. And so we could achieve that entirely on our interstate system which I'll discuss why we might decide to do that here in a moment. Um, but next slide. And so um, as Dan alluded to and are in the section seven document, um, we're kind of thinking about how we're going to approach this, especially from a pre-listing standpoint. And you know, do we limit our scope of enrolled lands, uh, perhaps just to the interstate system, or should we limit the uh, scope of conservation conservation measures that we agree to? Um, we haven't made a decision. I'm I'm interested in in folks' uh, thoughts on this. Um, if we were to only enroll the interstate system, say, you know, again, we have about 40,000 acres, 8% 8 of that is a relatively small number. Likely we would uh, probably shoot for conservation measures across essentially almost 100% of our enrolled uh, system at that point, um, minus some very urban areas that, that are frequently mowed for aesthetic reasons. Um, but again, that's a decision that we haven't quite decided on, but the desire there is to simplify that that section 106, section seven process. And so more to discuss there. And like I said, I'm interested in folks' comments. Uh, next slide, please. And that's a rare milkweed in Minnesota. Um, so we do have some hurdles in Minnesota. So staff turnover is a big one. And so as I suspect is the case with a lot of the DOTs and perhaps even the utility and energy groups uh, involved so far, I'm located in our central office where we do a lot of our large scale agency policy uh, work, uh, but a lot of the on the ground work occurs in our districts. So out in, in the state, um, out in our satellite offices. And, and we, we work uh, closely with those staff uh, and we build relationships, but when they turn over because they promote or retire, um, you know, we have difficulty making sure that our mower operators are remembering you know, what they should and shouldn't be doing uh, to comply with things uh, such as the Monarch CCAA. In Minnesota, especially in the Western and Southern portions of our state, we have a lot of mowing and haying by third parties. Um, as it stands, we have jurisdiction to regulate that, but a lot of it is occurring uh, without permit. Um, and there's been some recent legislative um, efforts to remove our authority to regulate that activity. And you know, it's a moving target. Every session the last few years have had bills, both you know, good and bad, um, and we're anticipating it coming up again this session, which starts next week for us. Um, it's a, a major priority for our governor. And so um, that's another issue that we're thinking about and 
figure out how we're gonna work within the, the confines of our law uh, to achieve the objectives of this agreement. Um, we also here in Minnesota have a mowing law. Um, that law is fairly old. It was originally adopted to help protect pheasants, the grassland, non-native grassland game bird. Um, but it hasn't really, no one, no one follows it. Um, no one enforces it. Um, but the CCAA doesn't align very well with what that law allows us to do. And so there's some concern about signing on to something that um, doesn't necessarily abide by the law, even though we don't technically follow it, but do we, do we memorialize that in an official agreement? Uh, but again, there's legislation, there's interest to change that legislation. And so we're working with our, our folks to, to see if we can't get something that, that uh, meets the needs of present snow and ice. Um, here in Minnesota, we get a lot of snow. We're pushing a lot of snow and salt into our roadsides. Um, we know based on some ongoing research here in Minnesota that salt in low quantities can actually be beneficial for monarchs, uh, but in high quali quantities, it can be detrimental. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're thinking about interstates as a potential for a habitat and there's pros and cons to that. You know, they're wider. Um, there are higher traffic volume. There's some evidence that actually higher volume roads have lower mortality of adults, um, but they also have more salt. And, and so you know, thinking through that process, and then just from a conservation uh, standpoint, fire, we do have a pretty good fire program here in Minnesota for our roadsides, but as anyone who's involved with burning knows, it can be very difficult to get uh, uh, the crew out, get the right weather, uh, the right wind conditions to implement those burns. And so we're constantly struggling on getting our burn plans uh, achieved. And so that's something that we'll have to um, work on improving. And I think with that, uh, the next slide is just my uh, slide with a uh, question uh, or an ask for questions and I can take any questions. Great, thank you, Chris. Really appreciate that. Any Any questions for Chris? Well, that makes it easy. Hey, no, 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 I'm not getting off <laughs> that easy. <laughs> Chris, real quick, this is Tim Lohner with American Electric Power. Did you just assume that all your roadways, the vegetation on the sides there, was considered monarch habitat? Um, we did. I mean, I thought, um, okay. Yeah, we did. You know, Barring the areas that are very frequently mowed for turf grass, which a, a lot of our roadsides are not, you know, in front of, you know, rural homes, the landowner may, you know, mow a, a couple hundred foot stretch and keep it, you know, an inch long consistently throughout the year. Uh, and then we have a few ur very urban environments where that may be the case. But here in Minnesota, uh, milkweed really does grow up everywhere. Um, and so there's, there's not, many roadsides that don't have milkweed or some sort of flowering resource. And it may not be a native flowering resource, but you know, it's gonna have this non-native thistles and, and things of that nature and, and monarchs are present. Um, we are fortunate that we've had a lot of research on roadside vegetation in Minnesota, including with a focus on monarchs because the monarch joint venture ha is, has been located in Minnesota. Um, and they find that I think in some cases, um, stem densities uh, that are surprisingly high, you know, hundreds or even thousands of stems per acre. Um, but we're really interested to see as we go forward with our monitoring, if some of those assumptions hold up. Okay, no thanks, that, that helps because we have some people that think, well, if there's no milkweed or no flowers, that's not monarch habitat, so I don't have to worry. And I'm thinking, well, you probably have to prove that because the majority of people in the know are going to say the, quite the opposite. So Yeah, and I think it really depends on where you are. I know that the, out west especially, it's a whole different world with respect to milkweed and and wildflowers and, and things. But here in the upper Midwest, it, it, it grows, milkweed grows everywhere, and then we have invasive species everywhere. And yep. um, cer certainly there are small stretches of road where 
because of chemical treatments and things, it's fairly grass dominant, not a whole lot going on, but um, that's, that's not a common thing. All right, thanks. Hey, Chris, this is Joanna with ATC. I saw on your slide that you're considering um, limiting your enrolled acres to try to make um, sure you can manage the section 106 and section seven. Have you considered, instead of um, reducing the amount of enrolled acres, just which covered activities you would initially have covered? Is that another um, way you are looking at things to try to yep. streamline that process? Yep, um, we're considering both and we certainly haven't made a decision there. I just kind of mm -hmm. threw up the one possibility as an example. Um, I, I see pros and cons to each. Yeah, okay. So I, 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 to be honest, we can get, if we enroll our entire system, we can get the 8% on our interstate system where we have that control. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a primary reason for picking the interstates is that we have control to keep third parties off of it from mowing and haying, whereas that's not the case on some of our other roadways. Um, so we can have the best uh, likelihood of, you know, actually doing what we say we're going to do. Um, but yeah, we we may consider limiting the scope of the covered activities or the areas that are enrolled at least initially. Certainly, if listing were to move forward, we would want to enroll our entire system, just given the prevalence of milkweed and monarchs in our state. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris, this is uh, Chris Gade. I was wondering, we've talked some on the DOT calls about um, not enrolling the paved surfaces, and it seems like you are including those. So what's your rationale on deciding that? Yeah, so I don't know if you can go back a few slides to where I had the milkweed growing out of everything, but um, it, there's a few reasons. One is just the tracking aspect of it, you know, so we're going to need to have, you know, a separate number for those, you know, surfaces that we're excluding and tracking that through time. Um, we know that at least here in Minnesota, when we reconstruct a roadway and it becomes dirt, some you know some of our projects span you know multiple years uh, milkweed will grow in that spot during that construction uh, it'll grow on soil you know piles it'll grow on just exposed dirt when the concrete's removed um, and so we'd, we, we would want coverage for that as well um, at least for us it doesn't seem like the acreage requirements to uh, participate are going to be such a burden that we couldn't do that. Um, so that's kind of our thought process, but I know others have thought about it a little bit differently. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Those are great pictures, by the way, Chris. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm going to make a point um, to get a few more this this next season. So. Great. Well, thank you for that. That was a great, great presentation, a great summary. Um,